This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Brought to you by... Sailing through the heart of historic cities and landscapes on a river, you get close to iconic landmarks, to local life, to cultural treasures. Viking River Cruises, exploring the world in comfort. Global hotspots from Cairo to Istanbul to Brazil, turmoil in the streets. In China, Japan and Europe, economies under stress. What does all this instability mean for your money? Hi Octane, why buyers are snapping up new cars and trucks at a pace not seen since before the Great Recession. And brain power, if your neighbors consume less energy than you, would you cut back? One company is betting you will, and it has to do with the way we think. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, July 2nd. Good evening, everyone. The world is watching Egypt tonight. Hundreds of thousands of protesters back in Tahrir Square for a third day. They're calling for the resignation of Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, partly over his handling of the economy. The army has given him a deadline to strike a deal by tomorrow or be pushed aside. But the president has reportedly asked the army to withdraw its ultimatum via Twitter. The turmoil there today hit markets here. Stocks dipped in the afternoon as oil prices rose. From Cairo now, Youssef Gamal Eldin has the latest. Protesters are in the streets of Cairo and across the country for a third night of demonstrations calling on incumbent President Mohamed Morsi to step down after just one year in power. You can hear the atmosphere behind me. It's a very tense atmosphere. People are saying Erhal Arabic for leave. But it's not just opponents of the president rallying tonight. Also, supporters of President Morsi are hitting the streets, and that is the key concern, that there will be clashes, that there might be an escalation of violence. And as a result, the military is on high alert. They've deployed to different parts of the city, tanks, helicopters. You can actually hear one passing by just above me. Remember that we're running against the deadline set by the army, which expires on Wednesday. Politicians need to figure everything out by then, and if they don't, then the army will put forward a plan. It's not clear yet what that plan will look like, but we'll have to just wait and see how it all plays out. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Yusuf Gemeldin in Cairo. Well, things on the ground in Egypt are changing rapidly, and it's not just Egypt that the world is watching, but also the protests in Brazil, the civil war in Syria, the economies of China, Japan, and now political resignations in Portugal. Does all this, all this pose a big risk to the global economy and your money? Andres Garcia Amaya is global market strategist with J.P. Morgan Funds and joins us now. Andres, I'd like to begin with Egypt. Um, worst case scenario, if President of uh, Egypt, Morsi, does step down and his government collapses, what does this mean for the global economy and what does this mean for American investors? I think for the global economy, uh, the biggest concern for both the global economy and for the U.S. investor is what that means for oil prices. Right? Oil prices might in the short term spike based on what happens in Egypt. But we have to remember, Egypt uh, provides less than 1% of global oil supply. Uh, so from that perspective, you might see a spike, but there are other, other players like Saudi Arabia that actually will open the taps and increase supply. So I think in the short term, this does create volatility, not only in the oil market, but obviously in the equity markets here in the United States. Andres, when you get this kind of instability in major countries, and Brazil is a major economy, but we also see instability in Istanbul, in Turkey, and now in Egypt, does that change the attitude of investors globally to take on risk? I think all of this is the outcome of a global economy, especially in emerging markets, that's not growing as fast as it used to be, especially in Brazil. Uh, a lot of the complaints is about corruption, but guess what? Corruption has been around for a very long time. The issue is now that the economy is not growing as fast as it used to. Right? So I think this is a result of that. So sure, it does create some volatility in the short term. The good news is that in, even in places like Brazil, the fact that people are bringing these issues to the forefront does help in the longer term for them to actually have to address it as politicians. Well, you know, investors have been told for such a long time that the emerging markets is where all the growth is, and now you're seeing these scary headlines of what's going on in this broad array of cr countries. So what are you telling your clients? I mean, what strategic changes, if any, should investors be doing right now with their portfolios? And on the flip side of it, are there any opportunities out of all of these crises? 
Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, great question, Susie. And, and you, I think you framed that perfectly because I, I don't think this is a time to make strategic changes, right? When there, are, when there is volatility, when there is uncertainty, I think the key is to stick to the plan. My biggest concern are that, is that investors are going to go to cash, which I think, by the way, is the most risky thing you could do because that's a sure way of not meeting your goals in the long term to retirement. Right? So you cannot get there with 1.7% uh, annualized return over the last decade, which, which is what you got on cash, right? So you have to stay invested. You have to stay the course. Let's look at the second and third largest economies in the world and get your perspectives first on China and what's going on there and then Japan. Sure. Uh, it's kind of the inverse for, for both, right? For China, I think right now they're going to have some short-term pain that's actually self-inflicted as they try to address some of their credit concerns, uh, credit growth that they've had over the last couple of years. That's actually going to help them as an economy in the longer term, not have to address some bigger issues down the road. If you look at Japan, I am concerned about it in the long term, considering they have significant amount of leverage at the government level, and they're trying to generate inflation. Don't know if they'll get it which means in the short term right now, they're benefiting from their efforts. But in the longer term, I'm a little bit concerned that they might not meet their, their target. All right. Fascinating information. Andres, thank you so much as always. Andres no Garcia Amaya, he's global market strategist with J.P. Morgan Funds. Tyler. And on Wall Street today, Susie, stocks logged early gains on good news about auto sales, home prices, factory orders in May. But then pop went the rally as traders focused on Egypt's turmoil and prepared for a shortened trading session tomorrow ahead of the holiday and that big Friday jobs report. The Dow today off by 42 points. The Nasdaq and the S&P each ended about one point lower. And that worsening political crisis in Egypt, uh, which is not a big oil exporter at all, uh, still managed to send crude up $1.61 a barrel to close at a 14-month high, just below the psychologically significant $100 mark. Well, as Tyler just said, there was more good news about housing in May. Home prices posted their biggest increase in seven years. They rose more than 12 percent, according to real estate data provider CoreLogic. And the company's chief executive expects that trend to continue throughout the rest of the summer. Well, while the housing market has seen gains nationally, the real estate market in Manhattan really came to life this spring. But there's an increasing divide over what types of homes are selling and who's doing the buying. Diana Olick with the story. Manhattan may be an island, but it is not unto itself when it comes to the issues now plaguing the U.S. real estate market. A big part of the, uh, the housing equation right now is low inventory. Manhattan housing saw its busiest spring since 2007, with sales up 19 percent from a year ago. But inventory was the lowest for the quarter in 13 years. Why? Same story as the rest of the country, negative and near negative equity. Many New Yorkers owe more on their mortgages than their homes are worth and are stuck in place, unable to sell. They may have refinanced, they may have taken out a second mortgage. Uh, when they bought the home, they may have uh, been able to figure out a way to put a small amount down, a smaller than what was the, the co-op actually knew about. With so little supply, prices moved higher, but only for condos, which are in higher demand. Condo prices up nearly 14 percent from a year ago, but they were flat for co-ops. The median sale price for a condo, $1.25 million, for a co-op, 665000 While co-ops still make up three-quarters of the Manhattan market, condos are rising, literally. But since the cost of construction here is so high, developers are targeting the higher end. That's your $3 million buyer and up. The Manhattan buyer loves condominiums. More of them qualify to buy in a condominium than in a co-op that has much more rigid rules about how you can buy, what kind of qualifications you have to have, both personally and financially. Manhattan real estate has benefited from a huge influx of international cash. Foreign buyers are fueling the condo market, paying all cash and buying, in some cases, multiple properties. But Americans are playing on the high end, too. The high end buyer is looking for everything on the checklist. If you deliver it, they buy it. Thousands of new condo units will hit the market in the next few years, but that will coincide with rising mortgage rates. That could temper general price gains, but high-end Manhattan appears to have no limits. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Manhattan. For more on the Manhattan real estate market, log on to our website, nbr.com. 
Well, it's not just the housing market seeing big gains this year. Auto sales are also in high gear and show no sign of letting up. They're on pace for sales of nearly 16 million units. This is the most since the year 2007. Detroit's big three each reported strong gains in sales last month, led by smaller, fuel-efficient cars, pickup trucks, and crossover utility vehicles. Ford sales, for example, rose 13 percent in June. General Motors up 6.5 percent. Chrysler sales rose 8 percent. And Phil LeBeau has been tracking the sales from a Chevy dealership right outside of Chicago. Phil, you know, we hear so much about pent-up demand that's driving sales. Everyone says it's because the average car on the ro road is so old. But really, how much more pent-up demand is left out there? Quite a bit, Susie. You know, I've talked with a number of economists who have been looking at the numbers. The average age for a vehicle on the road in the United States, it still is just under 11 years, and it's not going to be dropping anytime soon. So there are a lot of people driving old vehicles. And think about this, Susie, 20 percent, 20 percent of the vehicles in the United States are at least 16 years old. So that pent-up demand is out there. You know, Phil, mortgage rates have started to rise. What about loan rates? Are they going up? And what will happen to sales if they do? They're ticking up, but very slightly, Tyler. At this point, it's not even an issue. What you're seeing from the auto loans are a couple of things. One, they're expanding at the bottom. So you're seeing more subprime loans going out, people who have lower credit records. It's not a concern at this point because that's the natural, healthy expansion of the market that we tend to see as auto sales increase. The other thing that we're seeing is an increase in the number of leases that are being offered. At the end of the day, what the automakers are trying to do is to keep that monthly payment under $500 for most buyers. And if they can keep it under $400 or under $300, then people will move into those cars. But loans at this point, the rates, they're not ticking up. You know, the other thing that people are talking about and worried about is too much enthusiasm for all of this buying. Are auto sales right. getting too frothy, as they say? Could the industry and could consumers repeat some of the mistakes back in the, you know, those pre-recession years? I don't think so, Susie. Almost everybody will tell you what you're seeing now, sales matching demand. And as a result, this is a pretty healthy industry. All right, Phil, thank you very much. Phil LeBeau reporting from Chicago for us tonight. Well, meantime, Hyundai sales last month hit a record high for the month of June. But now the Korean automaker has announced a recall. More than 5,000 late model Azera sedans are being called back to fix a faulty airbag sensor located in the passenger seat. The device could fail to deploy with the appropriate amount of force in a crash. And two rival automakers are teaming up. General Motors and Honda will develop cars that run on hydrogen cells over the next seven years, hoping to cut costs by sharing designs and supplies while speeding up development as uh, automakers race to meet stricter global emissions rules. And still ahead tonight, the Fed gets tough with the big banks as regional banks hit new highs in the stock market. So which are safer investments? But first, a look at how the international markets close today. Some big changes ahead for the nation's biggest banks. The Federal Reserve approved today a new set of rules requiring banks to increase the amount of capital they keep in reserve. This is to help prevent another financial crisis and any future taxpayer bailouts. The new rules would require banks to raise the minimum capital requirement by an additional $4.5 billion. Most banks are already in compliance, and about 100 other banks need to comply, but they have until the year 2019. The rules are expected to be approved next week by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Office of the Controller of the Currency. And joining us now to talk more about this, Moshe Orenbuck. He is a banking analyst at Credit Suisse. Moshe, good to have you with us. Uh, I want to talk about the big banks specifically, as the Fed and the FDIC seem to be targeting those large, quote, systemically significant banks uh, with these new rules and potentially some new tougher leverage ratios down the, down the road. As these banks get safer, I presume, Will they get necessarily smaller, and will they still be able to generate profit growth? So I think the, the answer to that is they probably won't get materially smaller, but it has put a constraint on their ability to grow. Um, in terms of profit growth, uh, we are optimistic that they will be able to generate reasonably good profits uh, and returns. 
um, to some degree, it, is, it does depend on where that leverage ratio goes. The higher it goes, the more difficult it will be. The one thing that most Americans always worry about is how safe are these banks? So you talk about it limits, the rules limit their ability to grow. Are these banks, because of these new rules, much safer today? Uh, Susie, absolutely. I mean, they are significantly safer because they've reduced the risk inside their loan portfolios, inside their other activities, and their capital levels are and liquidity levels are significantly higher. Among the class of large banks that you follow, which ones do you think are best positioned to take advantage, number one, of a new, tougher regulatory environment, and, and number two, uh, of the economic uh, environment that you see? Sure. So, I, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the way I would think about this is that, is that J.P. Morgan has been really able to kind of manage through this and generate a 14 or 15 percent return on capital during this entire process. Uh, even last year when it had some difficult problems. So I think they're in a, in a pretty good position. Um, I think uh, the second name that I would mention is Citigroup uh, because it derives the bulk of its profits from outside the U.S. and therefore I think over time has got better growth opportunities. Moshe, I know you cover the big money center banks. You really don't focus as much on the regionals. But, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but we've been seeing a lot of these smaller banks hitting 52-week highs in the stock market. What's going on there? What can you just tell us generally? So I think generally what, what is going on is because long-term interest rates have risen, there's a feeling that that's good for banks. Because in general, when the difference between short-term and long-term rates is large, that tends to be good for banks. In this situation, I think you're going to have to wait till the Fed actually increases short-term rates for it to be a positive. And in the interim, it could be a little bit of a negative uh, for banks. And so I'd be a little bit cautious about the ones who have ha who've had the, some of those big runs. How important to the health of some of these larger banks is the health of the housing market in the U.S.? So the housing market is, is critical. It's, you know, it's the largest uh, financial market in our country, and banks finance it. Um, and uh, it's important to every single one of the banks in slightly different ways. Um, even Citigroup, you know, which, as I said, that derives the bulk of its profits from outside the U.S., has got some pretty big exposures uh, in U.S. housing and will benefit as, uh, as housing does get better. Moshe, we have half a minute. Just wondering, earnings season's coming next week. What can we expect from the banks, these big banks? So, yeah, always uh, the big banks with capital markets activities, second quarter is a little weaker than first quarter. The first part of that was pretty good, and so, you know, I think we, we hope that it, it won't be uh, too difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, you're going to see uh, it's, it's a grinded out kind of situation where it's blocking and tackling, getting your costs down and controlling them because it's a low growth uh, environment for the industry okay. broadly. Moshe, thank you very much. Moshe Great. Orenbook, banking analyst with Credit Suisse. And we look at a bank buyout as we turn to market focus for tonight. Capital One will buy back a billion dollars worth of common stock after it closes a sale of its Best Buy private label credit card business in the third quarter. The Federal Reserve okayed that buyback. Shares of Capital One touched a new high before closing at 64.24, up 1 percent. Lynn Energy, an oil and gas partnership based in Houston, dropped sharply after it said last night that the Securities and Exchange Commission is investigating its recent acquisition. At issue here, how Lynn was financing that deal and its accounting practices. Lynn shares lost more than $6 to $27 and change, plunging almost 19 percent on heavy volume. DeVita Healthcare, which operates dialysis centers, was downgraded to market perform from outperformed by Raymond James after Medicare proposed cutting provider payments more than 9 percent next year. A J.P. Morgan note says investors may pause while the dialysis providers lobby to moderate that Medicare cut. DeVita shares were off nearly 6 percent in five times the usual trading volume. They closed at $114 on the nose. Shares of Cree, the LED lighting company, also touched a new high today as UBS raised its target on that stock to $65 a share, just in time to see the stock go past that point at the open. Cree did give back some of the gains during the day, but closed above the new target at $66.64. That's a nearly 4% gain. And look at that one-year move there, more than 165%. Well, in just the third day of its existence as a publicly traded company, Noodles and Company jumped again as the Colorado-based casual dining chain sets a record of sorts for underpriced IPOs and investors lined up for seconds. Make that thirds, Noodles. Now up 35% just since Friday, 
up more than 22% today to close at $47.20. A setback for Dennis Kozlowski today. A new New York court rejected a request for a new parole hearing from the former CEO of Tyco. He's serving a sentence of eight and a third to 25 years in prison. Uh, he was convicted for orchestrating a $100 million fraud at Tyco. Kozlowski was best known for throwing a $2 million birthday party for his wife and furnishing his Manhattan apartment with a $6,000 shower curtain and a $15,000 umbrella stand, all paid for with company money. And coming up on the program, would you pay more for a bike than you did for your first car? Wait until you see the price tag attached to some luxury two-wheelers. But first, let's take a look at how commodities, treasuries, and currencies fare today. Here's a case of keeping up with the Joneses and making money in the process. If you found out your neighbor was using less energy than you, would you make changes? Would you use less? Well, one company is betting you will. Steve Leisman gives us a lesson in behavioral economics. Dave Chapman lives 35 miles outside of Chicago, and he has an unusual morning routine. Oh, in the morning when I get up, I make my coffee, and when I'm done with the coffee pot, it comes out and it's unplugged. I mean, I walk around the house and I make sure that everything is unplugged. But it wasn't always that way. Well, I really was n not aware of my energy use at all. What changes that Chapman began receiving electric bills generated by O-Power, a software company based in Arlington, Virginia, that has even charged up the president of the United States. This is a model of, of what we want to be seeing all across the country. O-Power's utility bills show users not only how much power they suck from the grid every day, but more importantly, how much power their neighbors are using. The company was founded by young entrepreneurs Daniel Yates and Alex Lasky. It comes down to, to basic behavioral uh, evolution and psychology. Uh, we are essentially herd animals. We do what other people are doing. My neighbors seem comfortable in their houses, and yet I'm using 35% more electricity than they are. There must be something I'm doing wrong. Energy usage data from 50 million homes, or half the homes in America, comes pouring into O-Power's headquarters, and it's analyzed down to the kilowatt. But how does this all play out in the real world? This graph shows what typically happens when O-Power's bills are introduced to a neighborhood. And as soon as we launch the program, the savings start to creep up. And this is very typical curve. Typically, we get to between 2 and 3 percent steady state savings from the group that's receiving this information. To date, we've, we've generated more than 2 terawatt hours of electricity savings. 2 terawatt hours is enough electricity to power the city of St. Louis and Salt Lake City combined uh, for a year. And certainly enough for Dave Chapman, who recalls the profound effect of learning that he was the neighborhood's energy hog. That's me here on the gray line. Um, this is my energy efficient neighbors, and this is all of my neighbors. And that's, that's, that's power in my hands. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. Well, one other behavior you could always count on, getting exercise and saving on gas money by riding a bike. But if you haven't bought a bicycle in a while, you may find that it could take several months of salary to afford some of the new two-wheelers on the market. But those bikes are big sellers. And Mary Thompson takes a look now at the brisk market for high-end bikes. For cyclists willing to spend, it is about the bike. Mountain bikers want bigger wheels, racers want lighter frames, and all want gears to be state of the art. They want the best of the best. Dave Volbach manages Bike Habitat in New York City. He doesn't carry a $32,000 limited edition Lamborghini bike. His bread and butter, bikes costing one to $3,000. Though he sees steady demand for higher end or halo bikes like this S-Works Tarmac. Built by Specialized, it retails for $12,000. We'll do probably roughly a halo bike a month in the on season. And during, even during the off season, we're taking orders for them. For Specialized, designing high-end bikes like the Tarmac helps its whole line high and low. Higher end definitely affects lower end because it stakes claim the performance level. So you know that the performance is going to trickle through regardless of the price level. Performance and the technology behind it key to driving new sales in the U.S.'s $6 billion bike industry, where an average bike owner will spend $420 on a bike, but an enthusiast will spend over $1,100. People with money and time on their hands who have a, an ethic towards exercise and fitness 
and the, the baby boom generation still drives a lot of sales in our industry. The data bears this out. The nation's 4,100 independent dealers like Bike Habitat sell more expensive bikes. They account for 15% of the unit sales, but 52% of the dollar total. So what's next in bikes? Some say electric assist bikes like this one. Retailing for $5,900, their electric motors gives a little bit more power to the pedal. And industry experts hope this will get more people off the couch, out of their cars and onto their bikes and help drive bike sales forward. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mary Thompson in New York City. The Obama administration has just announced that it will delay by one year the Affordable Care Act employer mandate to provide health insurance to workers. Fines for failure to comply will not begin until 2015. After discussions with business groups, the Treasury Department issuing a notice saying that it is doing so to provide employers with more time to prepare for the transition. They also say it will provide time to adapt to the new reporting systems. But the administration is still asking employers with more than 50 employees to still consider providing insurance for them beginning next year. And that's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrow. Thanks so much for watching. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody. And we'll see you here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been brought to you by Sailing through the heart of historic cities and landscapes on a river, you get close to iconic landmarks, to local life, to cultural treasures. Viking River Cruises, exploring the world in comfort. I'm Susie Garrett with a nightly business report news brief. On Wall Street today, stocks logged early gains on good news about auto sales, home prices, and factory orders. But the rally fizzled as traders focused on Egypt's turmoil and worried about Friday's jobs report. The Dow lost 42 points, while the Nasdaq and the S&P each fell by a point. In the oil market, the crisis in Egypt pushed up prices to just about $100 a barrel. New rules today from the Federal Reserve requiring banks to hold more money in reserve could help prevent another financial crisis. Former Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski, convicted of a mega-million-dollar fraud, was denied a new parole hearing. And Apple plans to build the biggest solar energy farm in the country in Reno, Nevada, to power a new data center. Be sure to tune in to Nightly Business Report right here on your public television station.